Hello, how are you? Wonderful. It's great to be with both of you tonight. And thanks so much for taking this time out to do this. I know you've got a lot of stuff going, a busy schedule, exciting plans. And we'll talk about some of that, um, certainly on your webinar that's coming up in June. But tonight I just wanted to spend a few moments talking with both of you about your backgrounds and just to let people get to know you personally better than usually we get to do on the webinars, right? Okay. Well, so, um, thank you, Judith. It's nice to get to do this with you across the country. Yeah. And uh, my name is Donna Bach, and I'm a naturopathic doctor now with over 40 years of practice. And I've been in private practice here in this little town near Yosemite in California. It's Sonora, Tuolumne County area, and uh, now for 37 years. And I come from a family of five generations of natural healing traditions and yeah, I wanted to ask you about that Donna tell a little bit about that so so well, how does my, that happen my grandfather was a uh, an osteopathic physician and his wife my grandmother was a nurse and herbalist and midwife and ever since 1917 when she lived through the huge flu epidemic she has been treating everyone with uh herbs and, and all kinds of natural remedies, and we were raised with all kinds of ways of learning what weeds and mushrooms were edible, things like that. And which and not. He was the one, yes, she was the one that delivered my children, two children at home, and uh, never missed a beat, even though the last one, she was 84 years old. And we came from this tradition from way back in the mid-1800s when John Harvey Kellogg was the one who ran the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan, who was one of my great, great uncles, my grandfather's side of the family. So what happened with that tradition was that as we were coming up, um, I don't know, from four years old and up, we always knew what remedies to use, what herbs to use, which places on the body to press, how to do the reflexology points on the hands and the feet. The first memories I have is people saying something like, why did you touch me right there? How did you know I was hurting right there? And why is it that I'm feeling better now? So that whole thing about being a gifted healer since birth was something that all of our family, five girls, I'm the middle girl of five girls, we all have that ability to just empathically and intuitively reach out and and touch someone. So when we first got started with practicing awakened mind training, the first thing Anna Wise did when we were getting our first training in, in uh, at Esalen is she was looking at my brain waves and she said, what are you doing, Donna? And I said, oh, I'm just in the healing mode. And uh, she said, well, who are you sending it to? And I said, to you, because Anna had MS, and so I could see she was in pain, and I could feel it. I could feel her pain, and I was sending it to her, and it was reaching way out to the edges, way far farther than it should have been, and everything else was minimal besides the delta, and she said, well, just stop it. <laughs> she wanted to see what my brain waves would look like if I would just stop healing her, so I kind of backed off, and she went, oh, that, that, that's more like it. At least now we can see you have other brain waves besides Delta. And so it was kind of a joke between us. It's just, are you healing me again? Yes. Okay. Well, all right. Thank you. I could use it. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's interesting because to inherit that kind of Delta, that's the compassion and the empathy and the radar of caring for other people from so many ancestral uh, generations above you, I guess you're saying that the, you inherited the sensitivity and the ability to heal all at the same time. So what was that like when you first saw your brainwaves or how did you come in touch with the work? I mean, did you know, <laughs> did you know all before you got hooked up? No, I, I never knew anything about what brainwaves looked like or what they did or never studied into it. Gary was the one who had all the training in neurofeedback and EEG monitoring and biofeedback since the 60s, but I didn't get exposed to it until about 2002. And when I did that the first time, and it kind of clicked, and it, I, I could tell that they were getting me. I, I felt like 
Anna Wise and her two assistants were the ones that we went to Esalen to take the class from. After we had signed up to take her whole training program, she told us, well, the way you get started, you have to have five-day experiential training and you have to come to Esalen. So we went, okay. So we went to that. And from that first few days of being with Anna Wise and being monitored and going through all the exercises to train the awakened mind, and then having somebody over there going, ah, there, there, that's a good one. Oh, good awakened mind. Oh, that's a nice one. And, and getting those little bits of feedback. And I was going, oh, that clicked. I know what that feels like now. And it all started making sense. It was experiential. And I had never read about it. Or I think I scanned Anna's two books before I got there. But not very deeply. Just sort of flipped through them. Went, oh, that looks good. I think I'll go to that. And that's how I ended up having my first exposure. When I was there as a naturopathic doctor who had all of these sort of esoteric experiences in my life, and then I was able to see that some of those were able to be made visible and they could be monitored and verified, and that it was actually a thing that was scientific, and that doctors and and engineers and other types of really left brained, logical, rational people were all there at Esalen, 27 of us in that first class, and that there were other people who were jumping on board to do this training with Anna that I was interested in at that point too, I could see that it was going to be a really good addition to my natural medicine practice to have something that was more acceptable by scientific community and more able to be measured and monitored and be able to see what it was that I was doing when I was doing it. So since then, that has become a big part of my life. And so did you make that part of your practice, the uh, yes. awakened mind training, or was it just a theory or do you actually hook up clients? How does that work? Um, when we were going through the first couple years of our training with Anna, it was required that we do a lot of samples of people's sessions and about an hour with each one for a, a, a basic profile of their default settings and then what we could do to help enhance the brainwaves to an optimal brainwave pattern. Um, I did a whole lot of people, including a blind girl who was only about nine years old, and I could see what happened when she closed her eyes, even though she had been blind from birth, her alpha went way out. Wow. Even though she was completely blind, just the significance of closing her eyes was exactly how Anna had described it in our classes, that yes, the alpha does get a lot bigger. And it has something to do with um, the physiology of closing your eyes. It doesn't matter whether you're seeing or not seeing. Yeah. And we did a lot of those uh, classes where we had 20 people in our living room all hooked up. And Gary and I would run those classes six weeks programs where they come for an hour and a half every week for six weeks on a Wednesday night or whatever. And we would just go around and get everybody hooked up once. And then um, the next week, uh, another group would get hooked up and we could do up to eight people at a time. So and these, these we were, were your uh, clients? These were your clients? These were not only clients, but also people from the local community college and people who read about it in advertising that we would uh, broadcast and people just showed up and did our classes. And we've done some of those recently, um, but not as much now as we were at the beginning. So coming back around full circle by going and presenting at the big energy medicine conference in France has gotten us rebooted and back to our um, more passionate thrills of, of being able to um, help people to really grasp what they're doing in any given moment and what brain waves are being active and how to actually train uh, for instance um, how do you remember something by developing your alpha bridge oh I could that comes in handy it's great for when you lose your keys so there's just a lot of things that I, I share with people all the time, whether they're hooked up or not, what's going on in their physiology and in their biofeedback and neurofeedback. Um, 
uh, just well, I'm glad you have come back to this work. I mean, it's really kind of amazing that um, that you were both in it from the very start, really, with Anna. And I wonder, Gary, so you were the one who was in the neurofeedback. Did you two know each other before you went to Anna's uh, seminar at Esalen? Uh, actually, we had just met not too long before then. And uh, uh, I just happened to say to, to, well, let me back up a little bit. I read Max Cade's book when it first came out. So I was quite interested in what he was doing. It was related to, you know, sort of my background. But he was in England. So I thought, well, I'm not going to England. You know, I'm, I'm in California and I have no reason to go there. But I'm, I'm interested. Then Anna's first book came out, and I was even more interested in what she was doing, but she was not at all around locally either. Then her second book came out, <clears throat> and I realized that she was actually here in California, uh, and that she was going to have a book signing not too far away from here in Sonoma. And I just happened to say to Donna one day, I said, I'm going to go to a book signing in Sonoma. And she says, oh, I know Sonoma, and I know the bookstore that you're talking about. And I want to go see. So we went down there. We talked to uh, Anna. She, uh, I first, you know, when she uh, said, I need a volunteer, <coughs> immediately I raised my hand. He was the first one that wanted to jump up there and be the volunteer. And so she hooked me up. And then uh, afterwards, we, um, we said we were interested. And she said, well, you know, you need to come to Esalen for, you know, a week-long uh, experiential workshop to see if you're even interested in doing this. And so um, we said, sure. So we signed up. We went, uh, went there. I think that was 2002, Two. September. Actually, it was September 11th, just a year after the 9-11. Oh. And so they had a memorial uh, while we were there. And uh, they had just opened up the new baths. And they had the new bath uh, upstairs. I don't know if you've been to Esalen. You know, of course, there's this upstairs uh, bath that has a special lift in it. And Anna was the first one to use it. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the handicap lift. The handicap lift. So we, we call it Anna's bath from now on. So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, that, we, was that, was, that was our first date, basically. Yeah, that was our first date, was going to see Anna. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. What a, uh, what a way to week. bond, huh? And not, you yeah, don't just so look at each week. other's personality or each other's spirit you get to look at each other's brain waves <laughs> totally. and it, it was perfect too because we were in the big house which you probably know and the side room there with the fireplace was completely empty so we had this entire room to ourselves and uh you know so after a week of of just meditating and eating great food and going to the baths you know five days of that we didn't want to leave again but then Anna said, okay, do you want to sign up? I'm just starting a class. Uh, and so we said, sure. So we, uh, we immediately signed up with her and started training. And I was going to say Annette Yee was in our training as well. Yeah, she came uh, through it from she, the beginning. She went through the same class with us and was there that first week when we were there. Anyway, we hope Annette's watching. We can say, hi, Annette. Hi, Annette. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she will watch. Um, and so this was 2002. So your training was in 2002 as well. Yes. yes, yes. We went through 2002. We completed the training in 2003. And then uh, we, uh, I think I've mentioned that we worked with Anna uh, at Esalen from about uh, off and on from 2003 until about 2010. 10, actually, yes. yeah. You uh, know, we just passed each other because I was there, uh, oddly enough, uh, two days before September 11, 2001, taking a oh, really? seminar with Anna. Yeah, my first yeah. one. Okay. But I didn't go back for training till 2005. Um, okay. It was it was expensive, you know, to travel from yeah. the coast. Uh, and yes, I, I couldn't also. believe that Annette uh, flew out every uh, other month to California from the Netherlands to take the training. Yeah, a little dedication. So, so anyway, we are excited about re- committing to carrying Anna's torch the way that she asked us to do right before she passed away. And by doing this conference we just got back from in Lyon, France, and continuing on from there, we expect that more and more people are going to have a chance to have the experiential knowledge of getting to have the feeling of self-mastery that is internalized you can feel when you are in certain states and you know which state works for which things anything from 
going to sleep in a better way, meditating in a better way, uh, driving a car through a dark and stormy night in a more safe way. You can just choose your brainwave and dial into the one you want and have that zone that you're so familiar with that you can then use it for personal mastery for the rest of your life. We're going to be talking about EFT uh, in the seminar. And I think, uh, you know, a little bit of background on that. I hadn't heard about EFT until after I met uh, Donna. And uh, I, a friend of ours mentioned that she was going to have a workshop with Gary Craig, who's the developer of EFT. And um, Donna said, well, why don't you go to that? And I said, well, no, I think you're probably a better representative to go to that. It was, a, I think, all a woman's group. It was just 12 people. And so she was the first one to go to meet Gary Craig to show him the uh, EEG equipment, the old Mind Mirror 3. And he was thrilled. And so then he invited us uh, to come to Boston uh, to demo that and do some heart map uh, with him in the demonstration. And then all of the EFT masters were at this um, event. And so they... Um, about 300 people. About 300 people. So a number of them saw us and then they invited us uh, over to England and to Europe. And so that just sort of got us rolling with the whole EFT. Fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that you'll speak more and give us more of this history that you just started telling a little bit about on the actual webinar so we can, you know, follow it through. But I wonder, Gary, if I can return to you and to you, John, as well. What changes did you find that Anna's brainwave training, awakened mind training made in your life? What, did you find yourselves waking up more or did it have any effect on you at all? Absolutely. It, for me, as soon as I realized what my brain was doing, I have a, a tendency towards being a bit of a monkey mind. Um, I would call it probably diagnosable ADD or a little hyperactive. Um, that I realized that the reason I had always been unsuccessful in learning to meditate is I did not know how to drop into theta through the alpha bridge and access the deeper states of consciousness until I went through the process that Anna led us through in the training that I, we, we both took when we went to her classes at Esalen. And from then on, following that protocol, I've had no trouble meditating and I do it every day. I, um, I, I think I mentioned on other seminars, maybe not, uh, that I started meditating a long time ago, back when I was in my 20s, early 20s. Well, tell, tell something about that, because I remember you talked about a, an awakening experience, and I, I think you kind of went lightly through that. I'd really like yeah. to hear more about that. Yeah, I am. Um, well, it's, it's uh, you know, I don't know if I can give you too much details right now, but um, when I was about 16, I had what Buck calls cosmic consciousness, you know, full-blown mystical experience, went into the clear white light, quite spontaneously, and uh, <clears throat> I, I moved uh, immediately uh, into this uh, higher state of sort of peace and tranquility and bliss, mm -hmm. uh, and at 16, this was rather difficult to talk to your fellow students about. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I was kind of there, and then everything kind of settled down after a while. Immediately after that, I said, yeah, I want to be an astronomer. This was my goal in life up until I was 16. I wanted you just to, wanted to get high some way or another, right? Yeah, yeah. I, was gonna, I was gonna go out there in outer space and you know, the infinity <laughs> intrigued me. Uh, and all of a sudden I realized there's this inner space that was even more intriguing. And uh, being you know, of a scientific state of mind at that age, I uh, immediately went to the library. I figured somebody else must have had this experience as well. And so I, went into the library and I just walked down the aisles running my fingers along the books without looking at anything and all of a sudden my fingers stopped on a book and I looked up it was above my head and it was uh, Richard Buck's Cosmic Consciousness. <laughs> yes. And that that's what started me off. Welcome um, home huh? You yes, found yourself home. in it. And then um, I went from there I went into TM I switched my major well once I got into college I switched my major to psychology unfortunately it was all behaviorism and rat psychology at the time uh, which is extremely frustrating behaviorism for most and, and what psychology 
Rat psychology. Rats. <laughs> yes, we, we learned all about rats running in mazes and that, you know, when you're interested in studying uh, cosmic consciousness, uh, it doesn't quite compute. Uh, so I went through the motions. I did what was necessary. And um, then I got involved with uh, one of the instructors, uh, mentor at uh, UCI, University of California, Irvine, who was doing research in meditation. And at that time, I had taken up uh, TM, Transcendental Meditation, uh, the early days there. And um, so I, I volunteered. I said, okay, you can look at my brain. So he hooked me up. And then I gradually learned how to use the EEG at that time and began monitoring people myself. How, how old were you then? Oh, 20. 20. That's yeah, pretty young yeah, still. Um, and then um, uh, after I, I eventually went into grad school, and uh, when I, I was at Long Beach State, and they had a, a, a chamber an isolation chamber, which was a room inside a room set on springs, okay, uh, completely soundproofed. And I got access to it, which was a mistake of the uh, other teachers around there letting me into that room. Uh, it was on the third floor, and uh, we decided that, or I decided, that I was going to study lucid dreaming. And so what I did, I'd read an article that said water bins would increase your, you know, REM sleep. I thought, okay, fine, great. So I put a waterbed up there, and another student and I, uh, he monitored the uh, guards that went around every so often and made sure we ran a hose up to the third floor into the room, filled up the waterbed, and uh, <clears throat> then I started doing uh, my own uh, studies in there of attempting to develop my, you know, drop into lucid dreams. But not hooked up, just just but not hooked up. Experience. Unfortunately, you know, back in the, in those days, the EEG equipment looked like an old refrigerator <laughs> and an ink and the uh, size of one too. Pens going like that, you know, eight pens all at the same time. We didn't have one in that room, but they did have one down the hall. And what they had planned on doing was moving everything in there uh, so that eventually we could do that. Well. Uh, long story short, the department found out that they had a waterbed in that room and they totally flipped out. Uh, and told me to take it out immediately, which I did. And um, then uh, I graduated, I did some other research, some other studies with their EEG. We finally got a what they call a PDP-15 uh, computer, which again looked like a refrigerator and probably has less power than my you know, pocket calculator. Uh, but it was amazing because we could record EEGs and actually it would analyze them for us rather than taking a ruler and going inch by inch over the mm -hmm. paper to find out what sort of brain waves we had. So, um, you know, time went by. I did a, a number of other things, uh, worn many hats in my life. Um, and eventually I wound up here in Sonora and uh, uh, one of the instructors out of the college here said, you know, I know you know something about biofeedback. Uh, how would you like to come and assist uh, teaching biofeedback out of the college here? And amazingly, we're a small community college. We have the largest biofeedback department in California at that time uh, because someone earlier, the prior instructor there, had had all sorts of money and didn't know quite what to do with it. So she bought all this biofeedback equipment. Uh, and then she, unfortunately, was uh, killed in an accident. And so was, my friend took over the department and uh, or the, the class. And so we worked together, and I taught everybody uh, biofeedback. We set up an isolation chamber in their flotation tank. Uh, so we would have uh, put them in the flotation tank and monitor them in there. Uh, and, uh, you know, heart math and skin conductance and uh, some EEG. And uh, so gradually, uh, you know, time went by and Anna showed up. And uh, then I wound up, uh, you know, I met Donna. Uh, and uh, she's a, a perfect match for me. And so we, uh, we wound up going to Anna's class. That's kind of a long story short. Well, what strikes me in that story is that um, even though the – Skinner's lab rats weren't all that interesting to you. You sure did like having your own little lab of rats there, didn't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you were able to study them and 
um, and monitor them in a combination of isolation tank and physiology measures, and then you ended up going into EEG. So it's a lot is about your curiosity, isn't it? And uh, and I know that you both got that same curiosity and uh, really, really enjoy um, working with people and that people will enjoy working with you too. So One thing I did notice that uh, Donna was saying that she had sort of picked up uh, when we started working with Anna as, um, you know, as I worked with her and because I was so used to meditating, um, I didn't exactly know what was going on. I mean, I, I knew I was going someplace, but I didn't yeah. know what brain waves looked like. Uh, and so what I would find in myself is that as I would drop down, I would drop down deeper and deeper and deeper, almost as if I'm falling asleep, I'm dropping into theta, mm. uh, which I didn't realize at the time. Uh, but I knew, you know, after Anna's work, that that's where I was going. But right around that borderline, all of a sudden, you know, it's like a light bulb would go on. I would be very deep, but very conscious, mm -hmm. you know, very much alert and awake. You know, that other aspect would come back up and I would go like, oh, I, I've just slipped into, you know, an awake mind pattern. You know, I'm in that state now. Uh, so, you know, it, it got me where a point where I could feel where I was going and actually know where I was going. Because mm -hmm. I had, even though I'd done all this other work, I hadn't been monitored that much on EG right. itself. Right. Yeah, it, and, and it always says about that subjective, objective match. I'd love to see your brainwaves at some point. Because with that much experience on that line of consciousness, I would almost wager that you've got that, um, that diamond going down with that alpha where that theta comes up and meets that alpha, you know, on that crossover. I'd be very curious to see. In fact, Donna, I bet you could just turn around and look at him right now and look into his eyes and with your sensitivity tell if that's the case. <laughs> I think he, he lives in a theta land all the time and uh, it's come, sometimes hard to bring him back to beta when I want to go, Gary, hey, uh, over here. <laughs> it's a good place to live. Yeah. Well, we really are looking forward tremendously to your seminar, um, not just because of the EFT, but also because it'll be interesting to learn more about you and more about how you've used the mind mirror, but also uh, a little bit more about how you connected up with those folks and some of the things that you found, you know, a lot of people know a little about EFT and I hope that you'll be able to uh, tell us more about the practice itself and how it works and stuff. Be happy to. I, I love sharing about emotional freedom techniques. It's actually plural because there's a lot more than just one technique. Well, maybe then there would be some time for you to guide us through something and maybe we could get people to hook up. That would be a great plan if anybody who is on the webinar wants to be hooked up before we start so they're already ready to go. They can take a, a baseline at the beginning and then we can tap on whatever we're going to do as a sample and then you can look at it again and see what changed. All right. There's their invitation. So we look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much for spending this time with us and we sure look forward to more. Thank you, okay, Judith. Thank you, Judith. All right. Thank have you. a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.